have a seat. If as you do so, if you would grab your copy of God's Word and go ahead and find Matthew chapter 13. And if you would find verse 24, that's where we'll be in a moment, so you'll notice that we have not turned to 1 Corinthians as we have been. So I've been preaching through the book, 1 Corinthians, but felt that this would be a good week to maybe maybe shift gears a little bit. We're all kind of in here together. Not only that, but I realized that we're only four chapters into the book, and I'd already had 14 messages under my belt in that book, so I thought maybe it might be a good uh, time to shift gears a little bit. And so... um, not only that, but I'm going to kind of stick, with, though, with the theme that Paul was still talking about in chapters 3 and chapter 4 of, of 1 Corinthians. And basically what he was dealing with then is, uh, is the idea of, of judgment for the Christian, for the believer. And so, and it, was, and it was a narrow focus. I mean, it was to the church. This is what you're going to face. And, uh, and so anyway, it was to be prepared on that day, that when that day comes, because it, it is coming... Um, but uh, there is also a judgment for all people. And so t- this morning is going to encompass both of those. So he was really speaking with just two believers and in that one uh, category. But today I, I would like to just go through what, what it's going to look like for everybody. And, uh, and I'm going to use three passages to do so, and that's my goal. And the goal is also is to keep this as simple and as plain and clear as possible. And not only that, because there is, the gospel is simple. It's the, the simplicity in the message. Paul often said, I don't want you to depart from the simplicity that is in Christ, the simplicity that's in the message. And so that's the goal today is I'll do the best I can what I got, but uh, to keep it as, as simple and clear as it possibly can. And so uh, the idea, what Paul was talking talking about for judgment is they're only considered one category, one category of people. That's believers. Well, there's only two categories in the whole world, believers and non-believers. That's it. There's no third. If you boil it down to its simplest form, uh, it is only two, believers and non-believers, right? And one day both will stand before God Almighty. And so we're going to look at these three passages and look at the two categories and just these three passages today. And so that's, that's the goal for today. And the first one we're going to see in Matthew 24 is uh, the uh, two categories of seeds. And so that is the title of the message today is two categories. And hopefully we're going to, we're going to just see the distinction between both as we look through here. But if you look with me in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, you see these two categories of seeds. It says this in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and, uh, and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn." What Jesus is doing here is he's sharing a parable. And the parable is simply this, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so he is sharing this earthly story. So it hadn't been explained yet. So he simply put out before them this earthly story, right, that they would have understood. And, and so and he begins by saying the kingdom of heaven is, is like a man. And he sowed good seed. So as he's sowing out in the field, he's scattering uh, good seed or, uh, there's, there, and, and, in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and, and uh, the enemy came out and sowed some bad seed. Now, here's the deal. The seeds, as they're being planted, as they begin to sprout up, one is coming up wheat, the other one is coming up tares. Now, what we need to understand is this, on both of these, is they look very similar in appearance. Wheat and tares look look very similar. In fact, you almost can't even tell them apart until they both matured. And uh, so the bad thing about tares is this, is that there's, there, the seeds are, are poisonous and harmful. And, uh, and once they grow up, they, are very, they stick very straight up. So they're very bad on the inside. You can't do nothing with them. 
Wheat, on the other hand, when it grows full grown, it begins to bend over. And as it begins to bend over, it, it's, it's, it's getting mature, and that's something that you can do something with, right? So wheat, and you can have grain, and all those, all those things. And so the idea that he's presenting before them is this, this, these wheat and tares as they come up. And I'm telling you, this is the two categories. There are only two. Uh, that, that is mentioned. And so although they look similar in appearance, there is nothing that, that you can do uh, with the tares, but you can do something with the wheat. Now, in verse, if you look in verse 26, it says this, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So now you can start to see the results of this. And in verse 27, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, the good man, an enemy has done this. The servant said, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, here's the reason. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the end of the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. Gather the wheat into my barn. And so this wheat and tares, as they grow together, he says, don't do nothing with it just yet. Let them grow. And at the time of harvest, when it's that time, and this is the idea of judgment, when that time comes, then we're going to separate them out. And right now, you can see that, that the wheat and tares, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. They look similar in appearance on the outside. I'll tell you, the same thing is true today. You don't know who's who and who's not. You can do your best to just judge by the evidence that's in their life. Uh, Some it's hard to tell, but on one day it will be revealed who the sons of God are. And it will be very, very clear uh, upon that day. Well, the disciples hear this earthly story, and so what's the meaning behind this, Jesus? You presented this earthly story. What is, what's, what's it mean? And so that's the disciples as they begin contemplating this, asking what, what, what's the interpretation? And if you look down in verse 36, he begins to give the interpretation of this story. It says, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And so Jesus, as he sends the multitudes away, I want you to first know that it wasn't for everybody in this crowd. The the crowds had already had begun hardening their hearts, been rejecting Jesus' teaching. And this is divine judgment that they didn't even get to hear this explanation. He sends them away and then in private begins to tell his disciples and so uh, I'm just telling you that so that this is a privileged conversation we're getting to see, but I'm telling you we're also included in that privilege. You get to hear this interpretation. That multitude didn't get to. It was divine judgment on them. They, 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 didn't, they hardened their hearts. They didn't want to hear, and uh, Jesus just let them go. In fact, what he says to them, who, who doesn't have, even what he doesn't have will be taken away. And that's, that, that is fulfilled in them right there. But the disciples come and they say, what does this mean? What's this story mean? And so here's now the explanation, what we all really want to get at. In verse 37, it says this. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. Okay, so the guy who's sowing the good seed, who is that? That's Jesus. So Jesus is the one sowing the good seed. The field is the world, okay? So that's everybody, everybody included, right? Those two categories of people. You can break down the whole world in two categories of people. And so the the field is everybody. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. So there is the first category. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and just write this up here uh, as we're going to look at these two categories. And this is, it's, it's really very, very, very simple. So on the right, you have the sons of, of the kingdom. Forgive my handwriting. It's just as good as my drawing. So that's, that's the best I can do. So sons of the kingdom. And then on the next one, he says this. So the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Okay. So now we know who the tares are in the wheat. So we got the sons Sons of the wicked one. And th- there's your two categories in this passage here. Sons of the kingdom, sons of the wicked one. Very, very simple and clear. And then he says this in verse 39. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, which we could have probably all figured that out, but he explains this. And then he says the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. So now we even get to see the role of the angels that they're going to play in judgment. They're going to be the ones kind of separating this out. And so you're going to be separated into two categories. And you're either in one of two categories because that's all that exists in the world. The sons of the kingdom, or the other one is the sons of the wicked one. 
That's it. If you boil it down, there, there's only two. That's, that's, all, that's all that you get. So now let's, let's look at what this means. And so in verse uh, 40, it says this, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, look at this, so it will be at the end of this age. So the tares, remember, those were, you can't use that. It looked good for a little bit, but once it grew up and, and, the, and the harvest was ready, the tares are sticking straight up. You can now tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. There's nothing you can do with that. The seeds in there are bad. They're poisonous. You can't even eat them or do anything. So they would take them, burn them, or bundle them up, and then burn them. And Jesus is saying the people in this category, that's what's going to happen at the end of the age. And you say, good night, preacher. You're preaching hellfire and brimstone today. Really, I'm not. Jesus is. This is his story. I'm just, I'm just simply explaining it, interpreting it the way that, that he is. And so this, there's, this, that, that's what's going to happen, the result of that one category. But look in verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things, look, that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. So fire is mentioned like that's three times now in this story. It says in the first one, the earthly story, that he's going to burn them up. And then in here, in this one, it says as they're going to be burned, so it'll be at the end of this age. And then he says, we're going to, I'm going to cast them. That same word you can also see later when they're, depart from me for I never knew you. And they cast them out of his presence. We see this, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But look, we can see some characteristics about these and the, and the sons of the wicked one. And that first characteristic is this in verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And so this group right here, they offend. That word right there, it means in the Greek a stumbling block. Those who cause others to sin is considered some, a stumbling block. So those who offend, that's a characteristic of someone in this category. In fact, if you want to be in this category, then those things that are in our life, we should, we should remove. But this person here in this category, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So that's a characteristic. They, they offend, they cause others to sin, but not just causing other people to sin. Look back in the text in verse 41. It says, all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness... They don't just make others sin. What else do they do themselves? They practice it. They live in it. They, they live in sin. So they're, it's just lawlessness, and it's all towards God, right? And so it's making them offend towards God, and they offend God, breaking his law and practice it. So they offend, and then they also practice lawlessness. And so this is a characteristic that we can see of this category. And the goal of all this is, is as we go through this, that you would be able to nail down today which category you're in. So we're going to just continue to go through this. And so we're going to present both of these categories. And and so that's the characteristics of that one. And he says, what I'm going to do with this category is on that day is I'm going to bind them up and we're going to cast them into the furnace of fire. This is what Jesus is saying. And then it says there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In verse 43, it says, then the righteous will shine forth. Those in this category, it's the, the characteristic of them is righteous. That's a characteristic of someone in this category. And not only that, practice righteousness. They don't practice all, they, this is what This is a characteristic of someone. But let me tell you this, and we're going to get into this later, it's not their own righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Their righteousness, it says, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. So in this category, that's going to happen one day. Instead of being cast in the lake of fire, the righteousness as it's complete and as God has glorified them and he's conformed them to the image of, of Christ Jesus, their righteousness will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Pretty simple, right, so far. Right, you see the two categories? Say, I see the two categories, if you see that. You see it? Okay, so that, this is it. So this, I'm going to make this try to plain and simple as we go through this. Let's, let's look at another passage. And we only got three today, so we're doing good. So there, there's one, and we see two categories. Let's look at another one. Look in Matthew chapter 25. And then you can look in verse uh, 31. And you're going to see two categories here that are mentioned. And Jesus is speaking on judgment here as well on that day. In verse 31 it says this, 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. Right? So the entire world, every single person that exists in these two categories will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. Now here's the difference between this passage and the last one. Remember, so the wheat and the tares, you can't really tell the difference. Well, Jesus can, and he sees it clear. And so although it's kind of fuzzy down here, on that day he's going to separate them out, and then it'll be, it'll be very clear. And so as he does this, he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, keep this in mind, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'm going to contrast that same phrase with another here in a moment. In verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, here's just an observation that you kind of see in this, in this category, right? So this, this is on, on the right hand, right? Uh, they did these things and didn't even realize they were doing it to Jesus, which tells you this. They weren't doing it to get into heaven. They weren't doing it so that they would be saved. They were doing it because they were saved. And they didn't even realize it. And so you can see they weren't even trusted in their own works, which is a complete contrast from those who do trust in their works. Because Jesus said, many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not do that in your name? Did we not do this? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because they, they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. This group's not doing this to get saved. They're doing it because they were saved. And so this is a characteristic you see in this category. Those in the right. Those that are, that are uh, uh, sheep. Uh, and I'm going to go through here about what he calls them. But this is, this is what they do. Uh, they did it because they, they had, there was evidence in their life. They had experienced God's love. And they wanted to love on others the, the same way that God loved on them. But let's look. Let's, let's look back and let's, let's categorize these. So there's two categories here. But let's look how he calls them. And then look at verse 33. Notice how he addresses this group. And he will set the sheep on his right hand. So there's the first thing he calls them. Sheep. That's not a compliment, by the way. If you're in this category and he says that, that that's not just something to make us feel good. Okay, if you know anything about sheep. But this is what he calls them. He calls them sheep from the goats. And so he calls them sheep. And then he says in verse 33, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you what? Blessed of my father. Another thing he calls them. Blessed of my father. So now we're starting to see how he considers them. You're seeing what's in this category. Blessed of my father. Notice he says this again. Uh, he says that, uh, and uh, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Look in verse 37, you'll see the next thing he calls to them. Then the righteous. Everybody see that? So now he calls them righteous. So they're called blessed of my father. They're called righteous. And then he says this, and verse 40, and the king will answer him and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, now what's he call them? My brethren. My brethren. I'm telling you, those in this category, that's how Jesus Christ sees you. That's how he calls you. Blessed of my father. All of these are something that have been received. And so blessed of my father, that's something you received. And so he calls it, you're blessed of my father. And then he says this, righteous. The righteous will say to me, something that's been received. My brethren, something that's been received. You see, and then you see the kind of the family, uh, personal, the, the, the personal relationship in the family of God. My brethren, my brethren, 
But I'm telling you, if you are not in this category, you can't say that. You can't say you're blessed of the Father. You can't say you're righteous. And you can't say, my brethren, that that's what you belong to Jesus. In fact, there's a story where Jesus is teaching and the disciples and, and, uh, and, and, and his mom and some others were out there. And they said, hey, Jesus, your mom's wanting to speak to you and your brothers. And he looks down, he says, well, these are my brothers and my mother. Those who do what? The will of my father. And so those who obey Christ, this is how he considers them. This, who obey God's commands. And so this category, blessed of my father. But it's also written in such a way that these are written in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense means this. It's happened at one point in time but with continuous action. Blessed of my father happened at one point in time. If you're in this category, at one point in time, there was a day that when you were convicted by the gospel message, the Holy Spirit spoke to you, he convicted you, you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. And that happens at a point in time, I assure you. You don't ooze into it, and, and, and there is a point in time where that happens. And when that did happen, that, that took place at one point in time, and the benefits of that lasted for all eternity. So blessed of my Father, it happened at one point, you received it, but the benefits never stop. That's the great thing about this category. Blessed of my Father goes on for all eternity. Not only that, but you can say the same thing without righteousness. When you, there was a point in time when you received your righteousness. And when you did, guess what? The benefits of that go on for all eternity. My brethren, there was a point in time where you weren't his brethren. And then you became his brethren when you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And when you did that, that happened at a point in time. And then the benefits of that, guess what? Lasted for all eternity. So this category, would you say, is a good category to be in? Right? Okay, you see that? But let's look what he calls this other category. Look in verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, what? You cursed. If that don't make your hair stand up, then nothing's on this is going to do it. So those who offend, they practice lawlessness, and guess what now? What does he call them? You cursed. And it's written the same way. It's written in the perfect tense and in the passive voice. So cursed, it's something that's been received. Not from your neighbor, not from your mama, not from your daddy, not from your uncle, not from anybody but God. You receive that from God. He is the one that does the cursing. And you might say, my gosh, preacher, I can't believe you would say that. It's love that I would tell you this because this is what God's going to do. He's going to hold this group accountable for this. For sin. He's not going to sweep sin underneath the rug. He's not going to let you off the hook. If he did, it's because then that would mean that Jesus Christ died in vain. What kind of monstrous God would kill his own son and then let you off the hook? He sent Jesus Christ to die for that sin. He held someone accountable for that sin. His son, who didn't even do anything wrong. He He was innocent for you. And he died the death for you. He was raised to life for you. So that you could have a personal relationship with God. But if you don't accept that, then he's going to hold somebody accountable. And if, if it's not going to be Jesus, and you don't want Jesus to help be held accountable for you, then guess what? You're going to be held accountable for you, and you will be cursed by God. And guess what? It's written in the perfect tense as well. It's going to happen at a point in time. And then all of its benefits are going to last for all eternity as well. It's written the exact same way. You will be cursed. And when that day happens, which is going to come on a judgment day, and when that day happens, the results of that last for all eternity. At that point, there's no getting out of it. And and it's just going to be a continuous action forever and ever and ever. If that doesn't wake some of you up, then I'm telling you, there's nothing to this. And you're going to be just like the crowd in that other passage. Let the multitudes go away, and I'll explain this to, to those who have ears to hear. But look here, let me just prove my point that it is going to be everlasting. Look in verse 41. He will say to those on the left hand, apart from me, you cursed into the, look at this, everlasting fire. How long is everlasting? It's everlasting. In the Greek, it means everlasting. Everlasting fire, but notice this. Remember this group? They had something prepared for them from the foundation of the world, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Very personal. God did that for them before there was ever material creation. Prepared for you. But notice in this category, it was not prepared for them. And the everlasting fire prepared for, look at that, the devil and his angels. If you go to hell and you wake up one day and you find yourself there, I want you to know this. It was not prepared for you. It was not prepared. This, on this category, had something prepared for them. Those did not. 
they went to hell as an intruder. Because this was, hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. Everlasting judgment was prepared for them. And all those who do not want to hear the message of Jesus Christ, who do not want to submit to his lordship, who do not want forgiveness of their sins and give their life to him, then they go in there as well. But it wasn't prepared for them. You go to hell as an intruder. And, th- and this is where they go. And it's an everlasting fire. That's, I don't know how many times you're keeping count. That's like four or five now that we've heard this word fire. That is the judgment. That is the judgment. You see that in the rich man of Lazarus of Luke chapter 16 as well. In fact, uh, the, the rich man says, please, Abraham, send Lazarus over here just to take a tip of his finger, just drop water on my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. It's fire. But look here. Look at the, the, what he's, the characteristics in their life. In verse 42, here's the reason. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. That key word is did not, did not, did not, did not. It's not what they did, it's what they did not do. There is no evidence in their life that they knew the Lord Jesus Christ whatsoever. There was no evidence. And everything that they did, uh, that, that, that's in their mind, I'm trying to work my way into heaven. But that's not the key of what they did. It's what they did not do. And then verse 44, it says, Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord. Look, they're addressing him the right way. They're addressing him with his proper name. But there's something wrong. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Again, that key word, did not. There is no evidence in their life that they'd experienced God's love, and then there is no evidence in their life that they're even showing it to anybody else. This, this right here is someone who only cares about themselves. This group right here, they offend, right? Stumbling block. They practice lawlessness, and God gives them the proper punishment, right? But not only that, but they had no personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I can boil it all down to you, that's it. You either, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. It is literally that simple. And what separates this two categories, and these are the only two in the world, right? Of all the nations, of all the world, there's only two categories. And what separates them is this personal relationship. There's nothing you can do to, to please God. You would have to get that in your mind. There's no, not enough good works I can do. I cannot please God. But the good news is someone has pleased God on your behalf. They are, their performance counted. And it was perfect and righteous. And that person is Jesus Christ. And when he went to the cross, he paid the sin penalty for you. And God poured out his wrath on his only son. And he judged his son. And, and, and I'm telling you this. Here's the, what, here's the good news about Jesus, what he did. He paid the death penalty for both categories so that no one would have to do that. When God says he desires all men to be saved, he means it. He, he, he means it. He doesn't will that anybody should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Right? Jesus Christ died for the world. He's the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, for everybody, for both categories. But God is not going to force you into his kingdom. He's not going to force you into a personal relationship with you, but he offers it to you. And I'm telling you, if you're in this other category right here, I'm telling you the the invitation is a personal extension from God to you today. And you could receive the forgiveness of God today and move from that category into this one. Because everyone in this category right here used to be in there. You were born in this category. You were not born into this. And here's the problem. Some people say, well, I've always been a Christian. I've always gone to church. And th- that doesn't do anything. When you're born, you're born into sin. The day you were born, you began to die. The death process had already begun. The moment you took your breath and, and that new baby is starting to get milk and as he's starting to grow, he's on his way to death. Something's got to come into his life and it's got to be a personal relationship if that person is going to get into this category. And God's desire is that every single person, every man, woman, boy, and girl would spend an eternity with him in heaven and to be there. But here's the problem. And this is, it, it hurts to even know this as a preacher. But Jesus Christ says this, many, uh, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And guess what? Many are going to end up in this category. 
But he says, narrow is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few will be there, will find it. That hurts for me to know, because I, I, I would love to just share all of this, and there just be of this huge floodgate. But that's the, most people are going to choose this. But guess what? That doesn't have to be you today. If you are out there and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that does not have to be you. You do not have to go through this. The Bible is very clear. He wants everybody to be in this category, but he doesn't have robots. He's not going to force you in. He gave everyone a will, and you can use your will today and choose Jesus Christ today. He gave that for you. And if you hear God's Spirit speaking to you, I'm telling you, do not let another day go past without responding. Because it may be that window's only open for so long. But on this day, I guarantee you, it shuts for good. And there's only two categories. So everyone's in the two categories so far, right? Everybody's still good? There's only two, and you're either in that one or in this one. Now, as he finishes up here in verse 45, this is his answer to them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And look at this. And these. Who does he mean by these? Everyone in that category. These will go away into everlasting. In the Greek, it means everlasting. Everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. This group right here will go into eternal life. This group right here will go into everlasting, and that key word, punishment. You say, what's the punishment for? Sin. That's what Jesus paid for. And when you're saved, you need to know this. This group here, we say, we say it all the time, this church word, right? Saved. What does that mean? You're saved from the punishment of sin. That's what it means to be saved. He set you free from sin, but also the punishment from sin. So if you're in this group, you are saved from the punishment that you deserve. Everyone on this, in these two groups deserve the punishment. That's the key. That's the key to salvation. You cannot be saved until you're lost. And what that means is you cannot be saved until you realize you need Jesus. You can't, realize that you, or you can't be saved until you realize that there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Everyone deserves the punishment. That's what we've deserved. We've all rebelled against God. There's no one good, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned against God. No one deserves eternal life. That's where you get grace and mercy. God gives to those what they do not deserve. That's grace, right? And that's Jesus, what he's done for them, because he's paid the punishment. And mercy, mercy is withholding that which you do deserve. This group right here has received grace and mercy. This group right here has rejected both. Jesus Christ died for everybody. Everybody still see the two categories, right? And this is what the Bible gives. There's only two. There ain't three. There's two. All right, let's look at the last one, okay? Last passage here. Look, we'll look in Revelation chapter 20. And if you find verse 11. In this picture of this judgment, now it's getting a little bit more clear. Throughout the Bible, he's sharing parables and other stories. But now in Revelation, you get towards the end of the Bible, it starts getting more clear what this is going to look like. And then in verse 7, it says this, or verse 11, it says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great, standing before God. Now, if you're standing before somebody, that's different than standing with them, right? So if you're standing before someone, there's judgment taking place. If you're standing with somebody, you're not being judged. So let me, I've kind of set up this over here to maybe hopefully illustrate this. But this is what God's going to do one day. This is not a great white throne, but it's a great white table. So some similarities here. But there's going to be a great white throne, and then Jesus Christ is going to sit on that, and he's going to stand before it. But guess what? All of those in, in, verse, in verse 11, from whose face the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. In verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Everyone, death is going to release them for a temporary time, and then everyone's going to stand before God, and then God is going to be behind his throne. And then he says this uh, in verse 12, small and great, standing before God, and judgment, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So here we see this. So you got some books here, right? So God's going to have a set of books. 
And then he's going to have one book, the book of life. And then he's got this book. So what, what's the difference between both of these? And, and the next part of that, he says, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Plural. So guess what? Everyone in this category right here, those who offend, right? Those who also practice it, those who are cursed, right? They're going to stand before God, and God's going to get out these books. And everything that they've done, written in down in here, and he's going to have all of it. And they're going to have to go through that. Now, since it's kind of football season, uh, football illustration sometimes works okay, but sometimes what they'll do is they'll mic up a player. I don't know if you've ever seen that, right? And so, it's kind of cool because you can get to hear what's on the side. Not everyone's mic'd up. They'll mic up one single player, and you get to hear what they're saying and, and what they're doing. And, and uh, I guess they've got to choose carefully on that, but they, they'll do that. Well, guess what? Every single person's mic'd up, and there's one person who can hear it, and it's all being recorded. The book of remembrance is also talking. So God has every single person mic'd up, and everything that you've ever said or done is written in these books. And if you are judged by, by what's in here, guess what? You will not go from here into this category. Those people are judged by here by their own works. Those who are being judged by what's written in this book are not being judged by their works. Guess whose work they're being judged by? Talk to me, church. Who is he? Jesus. Everyone written in this book, they're not getting judged what's written in here. They're getting judged by what Jesus Christ has done. And guess what? You go right on through that judgment, baby. And you receive eternal life. That's for those in this category. But if you're in here, if you're on this side, there's only two. If you're in this category, God will judge you by your works and you will be found guilty. But guess what? You do not have to stay here today. If you realize you're in this category, you can get in this one today. I assure you. And that invitation is wide open for you. Let's finish this passage here. It says... Um, and, the ju- and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. In verse 13, it says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, see, standing before God is being judged, and they were judged, each one according to his works. The, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. So death and Hades are gone. That's a good thing. That's, that's a shouting moment. Death and Hades, gone. But everyone that was judged by, according to their works are going to go right there with it. In fact, it says this is the second death. So here's what the Bible gives two deaths. One, there's going to be a physical death. One day, we're going to get, if Jesus tarries, we're going to get sick or something's going to happen and we're going to die, to put it plain and simple. One day, that's going to happen if he tarries. And when we do, if we if we're in this category, right, and then it, 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 the Bible uh, has a place where it says people that go in Hades, right, and they wait this judgment, a pl- and, it, and it's a place of torment, and then they're brought up, right, and then the eternal punishment gets 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 uh, executed, right, and God says he drops his hammer down, and that's it. That's the second death, and they go away for all eternity. Away from a God who loved them. Away from a God who made a way for them. And they will look God in the eye and know that. Why? Because Jesus' scars, you will still be able to see that in heaven one day. You'll still be able to see that. The pierced side, the hands, and the feet. One day, as believers, we're going to get to see that. And that's going to be awesome. Uh, and we'll exactly see at that point in time how much he really did love us. But for those, and they'll be cast away into the eternal lake of fire. Death and Hades will be there. Satan's going to be there. The fallen angels known as demons in the New Testament, they're going to be there. The, fa- the false prophet and the, and the beast in Revelation, they're going to be there. But you don't have to be. Everyone in this room, look at me. You do not have to go there. You do not have to be in that category. But that's who you will meet if you reject Jesus Christ and they're going to be there. In fact, it says this is the second death, and anyone found, not found, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so this book right here, if your name is not written in this book, then that's where you go. And the only way to get your name in the book of life is to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And so here in a moment, we're going to prepare for the last song and give everyone in here an opportunity to get into this category right here. There's only two. There's only two. Jesus Christ, his desire for you is to be in this one. 
But he is not going to make you. He is not going to force you into this category. But you have a wide open opportunity today. If you know God's speaking to you and he has shown you that you're in this category and you know it, then here in a moment, we're going to give an invitation. And as we sing, my plea for you is that you would come and speak to one of us and just say, you know what, I'm in the wrong category and we'll know what you mean. That's all you got to say. If you want to come before and just as when we stand and sing in a moment, you come forward and just say, I'm in the wrong category. We'll know what you mean. And we will help you get in this right category. And the way to do that is, is to admit that you're already not there. That's, that's a humbling experience. You've got to humble yourself and admit, I'm not here, but I want to be. And I know the one, the only one that can get me there is Jesus Christ. And I believe in what he's done on the cross. The death he paid and the resurrection was for me. And I believe he did all that for me. And I want his forgiveness today. And I want to give him my life today. If that's true of you and you want that today and you realize that you're already not there but you want that, when we stand and sing here in a moment, I want you to simply come and say, I, I want what you've said, preacher. I want, the, I want to be in the right category. And we'll help you. And we'll help you do that. God's desire for every person that ever existed is that they would be saved. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He extends it to you right now. And so right now, if in your heart of hearts and you know that I do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, life has been all about me. It's not about others. It's about what I want. It's, not, it's, it's about what I desire, not about anybody else. Then right now, would you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord today? Whosoever will, will come. Whosoever will. There's only two, but would you get in the right category today? Would you stand with me as we sing this last song? JT and I will be up at the front. We have counselors waiting. Today, if you know you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, are you a tear or are you the wheat? Are you in this category or in the sons of the kingdom? Which category are you in today? sing this next song if you want to get into this category the invitation for you is wide open would you come and receive jesus christ as your lord today receive eternal life receive forgiveness of your sins receive a personal relationship with the lord jesus christ and it's life that begins right now and it is true life and abundant life it's not just life on the other side you can have life right here and realize that there is a purpose for you and that god created you for a purpose The gospel message is simple. He who has a son has life. He who does not have a son does not have life. It's very, very simple. The message is simple. But will you receive it today as we sing?